Guys, congratulations. The finale of season two out in spectacular fashion. How did it feel to see that playing and sh to share it with the audience? Wonderful, terrifying, <laughs> all the things. <laughs> We're also quite jet lagged, so. <laughs> good, good, that's good. We like a Q&A when uh, yes. the participants are slightly vulnerable, because that means yes. we can get some of the answers that you might, that's if right. you were stronger, you could withhold. Yeah. It's a little bit like being drunk with sleep, sleep deprivation, so have at it. Jet lag actually helps with the comprehension of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so take us back a little bit to the edge of the diving board, the beginning of season two, when you were, you know, picking up on the huge success of the first run. Well, I, I think it's funny. We actually started working with the writers in the room before we aired the first season. The, the, um, you know, we, we, we were in a hurry. Not that, it, not that it shows. We were in a hurry to get this out as quickly as possible. It took 16 months. but um, So we started working on it before we put the, uh, the first season out. So no idea what people would respond to or how it would be received, um, which, which is actually quite helpful because you're sort of, it, it's still a bit, you know, it's still our, just our thing uh, at that point. And we knew that we wanted to start with, um, with uh, one or more of our hosts making it out into the real world. Um, and so the question, the question there was starting, starting with the end and knowing we were working our way towards that what was the most compelling version of telling that story. Okay. I mean, it is such a fascinating, complex, wonderful narrative. It's been credited the program with uh, creating a whole new genre, puzzle TV. Hmm. How on earth do you start plotting something like this out? And, and have either of you worked on anything of, of comparable complexity? No. <laughs> I haven't worked on anything quite this complex, I, I don't think. Uh, my, my first movie was backwards, so this is all still <laughs> yes. relatively straightforward. <laughs> um, but, uh, wait, what was the question? Did I mention the jet lag? <laughs> no, just, well, uh, taking us back to that whiteboard and the, the yeah. lifetime supply of post-it notes that you've had to stop. Yes, on, yes, there was a lot of, of pre-plotting. We were excited to get into the season. You know, there's, for me, it just, there's a lot of complexity and there's a lot of, you know, there's a sort of puzzle-like structure, it's true. Although, strangely, this season we played a lot of the, we played the timeline stuff cards up a bit. So the audience was with us and with Bernard as he tried to figure out what happened, but we understood his displacement in time. But the thing that always motivates me when, when going into a season isn't so much the puzzle aspect of it, which, you know, I do, I do find fun, but I wanted to see what the characters would do now that they were off the leash, as it were, and out of their loops. You know, I wanted to see what Maeve would become in her quest to save her daughter. Uh, and I wanted to see what Dolores would look like as a leader in basically of an army, essentially. You know, she, she's come so far from being this rancher's daughter next door, kind of lost and alone and vulnerable. And with the power that she's embraced comes, you know, conflict and missteps and misgivings. But I think it's all part of sort of organic growth for character. Not to mention Jeffrey, who's brilliant in terms of being this man who's straddling these universes and these conflicting loyalties. So I just wanted to get back in with our fantastic actors and play a bit. Yeah, and how satisfying to see him opening that door at the end there. Yeah. Like air <laughs> get punch out. moment, yes. Yeah. Um, so how do you strike a balance between keeping the audience guessing and mm. keeping them with you? You know, how do you know when you've got that sweet spot where you've just got it right? Uh, that's that's a tricky one. <laughs> that's a tricky one. I, you, we sort of use ourselves as as the benchmark for what we're tracking. We knew that this season we wanted to um, wanted to design a little more to an episodic structure. So the first season really ch checks in with everybody's story every every episode, and and here we wanted to we wanted to build out a, a handful of episodes that really stood stood on their own uh, while moving their story forward, um, and allowed us to dig a little deeper into characters. Um, who, in some cases, we had spent very little time with at all to sort of build build the world out. Um, here, the structure for this season, in our heads at least, felt fairly straightforward. It's it's a it's a film noir structure of you start at the end of the story and then you pick up the beginning, and that <clears throat> you you have your classic noir um, protagonist in Bernard who has forgotten something important and doesn't quite remember. Um, 
turns out he's forgotten Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we're endlessly interested with this series in exploring what it would be like to have an artificial consciousness, what, how you would perceive and understand time, how you, how you would perceive memory. And we wanted the show to stretch over, the, over eons, uh, you know, with these, with these creatures. Um, from the beginning, we sort of said this should be, you know, this would be a show about the emergence of a new form of life on Earth, and that's not a short story. Absolutely. And, and what about on set and when you're in production? How do you keep the twists and turns and reveals under wraps? Because that must take a fair amount of work. I mean, our, our collaborators were lucky enough to have this tremendous cast and crew who I think are as invested in kind of protecting the you know, the story and their character arcs. You know, they know they're, they're juggling so many things and they want the audience to experience the twists and turns with them. So it's actually, it's not that hard to keep it under wraps because we have wonderful, trustworthy collaborators. <laughs> we do, we don't always tell them everything though. <laughs> first, season, first season, Jeffrey definitely had an advantage because we had to explain to him, Lisa explained to him after the pilot, his character story because he had to play at least two different characters. Um, and it was only fair for him to be able to <coughs> craft that performance. So Jeffrey had a little more of an idea in the first season what was actually happening. We didn't really tell Evan anything mm -hmm. um, because we wanted her to be sort of stranded in her character's situation, guessing what the larger story was. Uh, this season when Jeffrey came back, uh, Evan, who remembered everything, we sat down with Evan and laid out the season for her. With Jeffrey, we explained uh, that we weren't telling him anything <laughs> and just kind of chucked him in. Good luck. <laughs> Joy. So let's talk about that cast. I mean, you've already mentioned two fantastic cast members in uh, Jeffrey Wright and, and Evan Rachel Wood, but also Sir Anthony Hopkins, Tandy Newton, you know, Ed Harris, got incredible performances across the board. It must be a dream as writers to, to see, you know, your words coming out of their mouths and, and to an extent to kind of know that you can, oh, I know that. Uh, th I will give this line to Sir Anthony Hopkins. That must be a really good <laughs> feeling. Yeah, I mean, when you when you have actors like that, it, it's funny because the way that they can elevate the words on the page and imbue it with such emotion, even even if they're not speaking English in it, even if the entire thing is in Lakota or <laughs> um, or Japanese and Japanese isn't their language, they they transmit so much emotion and so much nuance. Uh, it's actually, it's thrilling to watch just as an observer on set. And can I ask about, about standout scenes for you? I mean, I, I won't kind of press you on favorite episodes because I know that's like choosing children, but which have been some of the more, most memorable scenes for you from this season? Well, I shouldn't really choose a favorite episode, but my favorite episode is my wife's episode this season. <laughs> He's not biased uh, at all. Episode four. <laughs> episode four. Uh, a couple, the scene, the scene in there between, which we echo here at the end of the season, yeah. uh, between Peter Mullen, the incredible Peter Mullen, the incredible Ed Harris, and just putting those two guys together, and you, you know, uh, beautifully directed, beautifully acted, uh, and, a, and a really, uh, really compelling for me, that moment. We, we'd held off on introducing the idea of what the park is really for, for 14 episodes, you knew that you, you, know, you wanted to land on it strongly in, in one episode, and I thought it was fantastic. And that opening sequence, I mean, just, just wonderful. <laughs> I'm so poetic. I'm, as a music nerd, I was loving the kind of, you know, the imagery of the, the record just going round and round, and wow. fidelity, of course. What about you, Lisa? For you, any, any standout scenes or a favorite episode? Uh, you know, it, it's funny because as, as I was filming that episode, you know, you saw it later in this episode, and it's actually a scene that, that Jonah shot, but uh, the scene where, where Delos talks to Logan and you see that moment that has haunted him throughout his life. It's sort of the, the punchline to an episode that we set up uh, in this episode. And I, I actually found it really heartbreaking, um, Ben Barnes' performance there. You've known him as this kind of cad and this playboy, uh, and, and to see the pain underneath that, and. It also gave new light to James Delos, I think, in, in the sense that he's a man haunted by his own regrets. Uh, I think it speaks to a sort of commonality amongst all people, that we're all plagued by our own demons. And it made them both vulnerable, vulnerable to me in, in a new way that uh, kind of broke my heart a bit. I mean, the cinematography is, is just stunning in the show. Um, how much work goes into creating the visual language of the program? And how do you keep it coherent when you are creating these standalone episodes and these you know, worlds that we're, we're stepping outside of Westworld, but we still feel like we're in the show? Mm. 
Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, we, we, fantastic crew is, is the short answer to that. I mean, we started um, set to look for the series in the pilot with Paul Cameron, the DP, the fantastic DP. Uh, and then we've collaborated with some brilliant DPs since then. Uh, this season, Darren Tiernan, John Grillo. Um, and, uh, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, the, the fun challenge this season was maintaining the looks of what we've already established in the show and then moving on to build new worlds. So with Shogun World, there's a lot of conversation there about what the look and feel of that which should be. And obviously we were uh, riffing on Kurosawa. And so we went back and looked at all of his films to see if there was a signature film stock or a signature uh, you know, aspect ratio or anything that we could play with. Um, and it, Kurosawa was restless. He moved back and forth between black and white and color. He moved back and forth between different aspect ratios, different stocks. There wasn't any one signature thing. So we developed our own, uh, our own look for that sequence. It was sort of a modified skip bleach look. Again, using, using the fact that we shoot on film to try to evoke a different era in film. Uh, in, in the Raj uh, sequences in episode three, we used tungsten film to give it a, a slightly different texture as well. So there's a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of really talented people spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to make it all feel of a piece, but make, you know, give, give episodes a sort of a distinct identity as well. And the decision to shoot on, uh, I have to get this right, anamorphic uh, film. Mm. Tell me about that, because I, I, I heard a rumor that, you know, that, that plays into perhaps some of the timelines, and you know, you mentioned aspect ratio. Yeah, I, I mean, really just an excuse to shoot anamorphic, because it's beautiful. <laughs> Quality of lenses is, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I love, you know, I, I love the look of the pilot. Um, you know, most of the show is shot three perf 35 millimeter film, which means spherical lenses. When you shoot anamorphic lenses, your, your bokeh and your, your focus, it, it rolls off in this very beautiful way. There's about 30 minutes of that footage in this episode. And it just has a totally different, beautiful texture to it, um, which, which we thought would very nicely, um, gently suggest to the audience that there was something about those sequences that wasn't quite right. And you get to these, these later episodes, six and um, six, seven, and uh, the finale, and understand that that's our gentle way of putting you into a virtual space. It's so interesting, and that, that reminds me of, of the music. You know, we were talking on the on the, the fan show about, about the music yesterday and the way that you can almost have this, you're kind of being cued subliminally. You know, you're joining in with these instrumental covers of songs that we love so much. I mean, Heart Shaped Box for me is, is the standout music moment in, in this season. Um, but of course, there are no lyrics, so we have to provide them ourselves. So you're putting us in a kind of subconscious mental state almost. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's incredible. and. Tell me a little bit about, about the way that the audience interact with the show, because I'm fascinated by the idea that you know, you're know you mapping out season two while season one is still going out. You're placing you know, in high expectations on your audience. And you know, in the, way back, the, the received wisdom was that you could never um, underestimate your audience's intelligence. You guys very obviously don't do that. You, know, you, you were expecting them to kind of join in and, and meet and, with you and engage with this work. Were you 100% sure that they were going to do that, you know, from the beginning? And, and, and what was it like when they did? I mean, for me, you know, I, I started my first love in, in, in writing and in literature was actually poetry, right? And, and there are certain poems that you read that, you know, if you read Eliot or The Wasteland or such, it, 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 he's actually footnoted the damn thing <laughs> in case you wanted to understand the illusions. But I think the key is that on an emotional level, there's, there's one level of engagement that even if you're not you know, analyzing the vicissitudes of the film stock and such, you can enjoy Maeve's you know, drive. You know, there's very much, at, at its core, this season for me is defined by different love stories. You know, Maeve's love for her daughter, which propels her back into the park and this act of self-sacrifice. There's also Akichita's love of his wife, you know, and the things, the lengths that he will go to in this kind of Orpheus and Eurydice tale. Um, and then there's this interesting relationship, too, between Dolores and Teddy, right, where they finally have free will, the chance to define themselves. But to survive, to lead this army, she has to become a bit of a different person. And I think, you know, anybody who's in long-term relationships, they're defined a little bit by not just, you know, a snapshot of love that endures and endures. We're always changing and growing, and some of those changes can be challenging. Um, and so it's about this couple and, and the ways in which they're growing together and changing and whether they can kind of hold on 
to this this bond that they have. L loosely semi-autobiographical. <laughs> <laughs> the, the year in which you reprogrammed me to be evil. <laughs> I'd give him a British accent. How is this part of the baseline test? Yes. Just to check. <laughs> okay. I mean, and and you know when people kind of join in with that and you see the the vast amount of kind of fan conversation forums you know fan theories i doing the fan show you know on, on yeah. sky atlantic had the most fantastic time <laughs> engaging with some of them i was loving you know everybody's kind of saying, oh they're looking for the door it could be theodore is it teddy like <laughs> just you know really brilliant kind of creative yeah, that's pretty good stuff like week on week do you do you spend much time kind of you know dipping into that and does it ever spark ideas ideas for you or possibilities? Lisa doesn't. I do a little bit of it to get a sense for, you know, whether things are being understood. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's fun. I mean, the, the, the most fun part about it in terms of the fan engagement with the show is, is the artwork and the music and the, the thought that goes back into it, these fan-made posters, which are in, incredibly beautiful. Um, and that's that's great fun. Uh, you know, we we do this in part because it's the kind of show that we would like to watch, um, which is why it's layered and uh, and complex. It's the kind of movies that I wanted to be watching uh, in a moment in which, like I said, when we started, you know, way back when with Memento, that movie felt like an answer to me for the kind of movie that I wish I could watch. Um, and so we just, you know, I, I don't think you can. I don't think you can guess what people are going to like. You just have to try to make things that, that satisfy you, know, you, you yourself. And we massively appreciate all of the Easter eggs that you leave in there for <laughs> us and all of the fun stuff. Do you have a favorite? I mean, you know, Lisa, you mentioned your, your love of poetry. There's some great kind of William Blake in there that, yeah, that I was very much enjoying. There's a bit of that. And I love Vonnegut. So you'll see uh, Vonnegut bo books strewn around all sorts of sets uh, as a little shout out to him. Yeah, and we named the goldfish in my episode Kurt after him, but you guys, that didn't really come up. He doesn't have a title card. <laughs> but just so that, you know, it was Kurt. Now that we know that, I think he would appreciate the humor in that, that he's the one with the short memory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what about you, Jonathan? I know you're a, you're music, a music lover, so perhaps. Yeah, I think my favorite musical moment during the season was the Wu-Tang Clan. Uh, cameoing episode five, long time coming, a lot of fun. Okay, any others? Mm. Well, that kind of takes the fun out of it in terms of the Easter eggs. Okay, <laughs> we're going to keep looking, we're going to keep looking. We think we've got them all, we're keeping a list. Um, Westworld, of course, not afraid to grapple with the big questions. It po positively relishes sinking its teeth into them. What are the biggest themes of season two for you? You know, well, definitely there's a kind of inquiry into immortality and, and human nature and how much free will we have, you know, which felt like a sort of logical extension of what we were setting up first season. First season, we were looking at the host's agency and how they were trapped in loops of behavior. And second season, there's a sort of paradigm shift where now, quite literally, it's the humans who are being experimented on, the humans who are in their own little fishbowl being observed and studied only to find that they too can be reduced to some rather elementary building blocks. And when you start to think about the drives that humans have and the amount of complexity in their lives, I think sometimes you know, we find that we, we are maybe simpler in some ways than we thought, more, more manipulable. We have our own building blocks. And some of those building blocks are amazing, right? Maternal instinct, paternal instinct, uh, and, and our loops are not that wide when we were, when we were exploring this, Joan and I would laugh that our, our loops were much smaller than the host's loops. You know, we would just go to the office and write and eat and put our children to bed and then write some more. And, and that was basically it for about four years. So uh, <laughs> that's... Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and Jonathan, what about you? The um, big themes of season two? Yeah, the biggest one being free will, which the more we read and thought we sort of started with this proposition in the finale, working our way back to it, of, oh, actually, humans don't have free will. And then the more we read about it, which felt like a bit of a science fiction conceit, or, you know, the more we read about it, the more experimental evidence um, there is that that's, that is actually the case. Um, you know, and, and in, in the neuroscience community, there's a bit, of a, um, a bit of paradox about what to do about this. There's a fantastic article in The Atlantic several months ago 
um, that informed part of this last episode where we basically lay out that as far as we can tell, um, free will is an illusion. If you put up, um, if you image someone's mind and put them in an experimental testing chamber and ask them to do something simple like, you know, um, press a button on the left or the button on the right when you're cued by an image, what they found, and this has been repeated and has been part of the experimental record for 30 years, what they found is that <clears throat> uh, about a millisecond or, or, or so before you make the conscious choice to press the button on the left or the right, something else um, in your mind makes that decision for you. And you can see it. You can see it in magnetic resonance. There's, there's a imaging that there's, there is some other part, and this is the name of the episode is the passenger in part because there is this other, <clears throat> you know, there, there is this other thing really at the wheel, our subconscious. And our conscious mind is really basically, I always picture, we laughed about it in the room, you, if you remember the beginning of The Simpsons, um, where it's, uh, it's, it, Maggie has the little fake steering wheel. <laughs> <laughs> That's consciousness, <laughs> right? Marge is at the wheel. We don't get to talk to her. Uh, we're Maggie, looking out the window and imagining we're making decisions. And, and most of the experimental evidence seems to suggest that we're not making any decisions at all. And it's so interesting that that's poetry as well, because I can't remember which poet it was uh, said that, but you know, they said that the words in a poem is a kind of big juicy bone that the burglar gives to a dog to keep it distracted <laughs> while the rest of the poem does its work on your sure. subconscious. Love that. So it's so interesting that they're connected. Well, even the thought of a muse, you know, it, it used to be quite a literal thing, the idea that a muse would alight upon your shoulder and kind of tell you what to do and what not to do, right? That it wasn't, that humans were just vessels for some other form of thought. Mm -hmm. uh, so so, you know, it's something that has always been played with, this notion. Yeah, there's a line or two that, unfortunately, uh, as you guys just experienced, that's a fairly long episode of television. Uh, <laughs> one or two lines in there we had to cut out. At one point, um, someone refers to the, the idea that, um, um, that, that it's, a, it's a little, our, our belief in our own agency and our free will is a little akin to our belief in God when, you know, it's probably just the weather, right? We, we experience... We experience our consciousness as making decisions, but that's not really necessarily what's happening. Um, it's all wrapped up in a superficial level of complexity. Uh, and the idea that, the, that the, the host would be able to kind of reach down into the fabric of their decisions and alter them is something we just found very interesting. It's extremely compelling. Well, I think I've prevailed on you with enough questions. We're going to turn it over to the audience. <laughs> You know, the Western, when you start taking it apart, we're fascinated by the idea that you have this moribund genre here that, that you know, that you, and it was the most sort of terrifying part of launching the show was that half of it was this dead genre. But you had this wonderful kind of way, even actually, even when Crichton wrote the original film in 72, 73, the, the Western was very clearly on its way out. Um, but I think for him and for us, it is a genre that is so consistent. The rule set is so... Um, simple, uh, some fantastic films made in the genre. And I grew up a fan, you know, watching LWT, Sergio Leone, uh, Spaghetti Westerns um, as a kid. You know, there are some phenomenal movies there. Um, but they all have this underlying structure that is really interesting and is, and is an investigation of good and evil and, and free will and sort of, you know, people trying to um, build you know, uh, ethical systems out in the back end of beyond where there's nothing else to support them. It's kind of a fascinating, fascinating genre uh, and a shame that we're done with it. Hopefully not totally done with it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, this series is about the emergence of a new life form and, and what happens. You know, we're kind of using that story also as a mirror to examine human nature, you know, and so as Dolores and the hosts continue to make choices and continue to expand their world and their entanglement with our world. I think you know the themes will you know emerge emerge from that. And uh, there's there's a lot to be said about you know we've we've consciously shifted the lens of our um, sympathies in a way this season. You know, and in a lot of westerns, traditional traditional mythologies, which a, a western really is, the idea of Good versus evil is really quite binary. You know, there's the white hat or the black hat, really. And what we're trying to do is to delve deeper and deeper into character as we go through it. And eventually, I think you see everything is shades of gray, uh, and different different circumstances reveal different aspects of character. So we'll continue that exploration um, writ large.
Yeah, I think one of the things we're excited about is less thematic, although, it, it, as Lisa said, it has rich thematic possibilities. The third season is our world. And we get a chance to see what that world looks like 30 years. We glimpsed it in the beginning of the season. Uh, but we're incredibly excited. You know, the, the story to this point has taken place in this artificial reality. And for the story to move forward, we, we now have this uh, fun slash terrifying challenge for the third season of building out what the world, what the real world looks like, and what uh, Dolores and uh, and uh, and the others will find out there. You know, when we were writing the pilot, uh, I pitched a scene to end the entire series on, and so far we have not deviated uh, from liking that scene. <laughs> so, you know, you never want to. Um, my joke is this: this part of the season is a cautionary tale about hubris. And as a writer, you never want to tempt a smiting from the TV god. So I would never venture to guess how many seasons we will live for. But I do think that, um, you know, that there, there are sort of tentpole moments that we're trying to work towards. And, and hopefully, we'll reach our ending in the time that we have. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a subject for me now that's come up in three separate projects. We started with um, person of interest. And, uh, and then Interstellar, you know, that film, some of my favorite characters were the artificial characters. Um, and, and then again with Westworld, and when, uh, when, when JJ reached out to us about the project, he had a preliminary conversation about what, what if, uh, he'd actually sat down with Michael Crichton 20 years, 20 years ago and talked about remaking the film, and then he couldn't, you know, he sort of noodled on it in his inimitable J.J. Abrams way for 20 years, and then turned around and called us up and said, what about a TV series? Um, and we went back and forth about it. Lisa's point was, this is everything that we're interested in, and, and everything that we're talking about right now in terms of artificial realities and artificial intelligence consciousness and, um, and, and human nature. Um, which I've always been fascinated by, you know, memory and morality and all the, all the stuff that, that we're made of, which is all, you know, which is all a bit strange, really. Um, and looking at it from the perspective of a creature, a set of creatures made in our image, which is kind of irresistible. So really, the, the two things came together very nicely. I, you know, my, my point with artificial intelligence is, you know, I, I'm not really sure why anyone would be writing about anything other than artificial intelligence right now, because you know, and, and there have been false alarms on this over the over the over the 50 or so years or 70 years that people have been speculating. Um, you know, I think the the you know Gene Roddenberry would be very disappointed that we're not already there, but it does feel in this moment like we are stumbling into it a bit, and that opportunity to write about something before it's arrived, analogous to people making films and trying to tell stories about eventual um, space travel. And then, you know, Saturn V comes along. So we've just got a few years left in which we can speculate before the AI shows up and tells us to stop writing about it. <laughs> That's definitely a snippet of something that we will come to explore uh, in the future, and it is definitely timeline to the nth power. Uh, you know, the thing that really appealed to us about a story about artificial intelligence is it truly is immortal. You know, we're, we're dealing with an epic time scale at this point, and so the end is just a little bit of a tease of part of the scope of where we're going uh, and part of the characters that you're going to see there. You know, for our, for our series, even when we started in, in, in the in the pilot, there's definitely you know there's there's definitely a way to do it. You know, Damon in Lost they really believed in the mystery box and not looking too much inside the mystery box. That it was a kind of idea generator that you didn't need to dissect and open up. And that's an absolutely uh, fascinating and engaging way to tell a story. Um, but for us, you know, I think we are interested in dismantling the mystery box, opening it up, looking at what it is, putting it together like it's some kind of Lego, seeing how it works, um, and really questioning and exposing that. So each season, what we try to do is the questions that we tee up, we do try to address. We have an answer for all of them. And then the things, and we try to set a little bit more, like what you saw in um, the scene with the man in black at the end, to show where it's going. But we do, we do intend to answer the questions that we set up. 
Yeah, I, I thought Lost was a fantastic show. It was one of the reasons why I, I, I wanted to sit down with, with JJ many, many years ago to talk about television. Uh, it's beautifully made, and there are some spectacular um, individual episodes, uh, you know, some beautiful storytelling there in the aggregate. Um, a very compelling, very beautiful um, show. Slightly different approach, as Lisa was saying, to, um, to the long haul storytelling. For us, we don't want to wear out our welcome. We have no interest in making this show until it hits syndication and people, you know, watch it over and over again. It's, it's, luckily, we're in a moment in television in which you don't have to do that, you know. Um, so for us, frankly, we've approached the logic of making the show a little more like a film franchise where each season, as Lisa said, sort of settles its debts for the most part with the audience uh, and sets up some interesting questions for the next season. Uh, we don't want to do this forever. <laughs> well, we'd certainly like you to keep going for as long as you can. Um, that's absolutely fantastic. That's all the time we've got tonight. Guys, thank you so much for the great questions.